And so here's someone who seems to have it all. Looks, fame, fortune, success, family, friends, yet still feels that there's this simple. So a few years back, a writer for Forbes magazine did a poll for their readers, and they asked this question. If you could say in one word what you want more of in life, what would that be? Now, as the results of the poll flooded in, it quickly became very obvious that there are these universal desires that we all have that exist well beyond our ethnicity, our gender, or our background. And a commonality that proves that no matter where we're from, what we've done, how we think, or how we vote, we're all, deep down, very much the same. So the results of the poll were published in a story titled, The Top Eight Things That People Desire But Can't Seem to Attain. And now before we go any further, just think about that title for a minute. I mean, it's true, but man, it's so sad. Millions of people around the world spending their lives trying to attain something that's always just out of reach. Man, the list included joy and happiness, peace, freedom, balance, money, confidence, and fulfillment. Now, obviously, some things on this list are a means to an end, right? People think money and balance and confidence are ultimately going to bring them happiness. And so as you boil this list down, you're left with this more foundational list of what everybody wants, and that's joy and happiness and peace and purpose. And you can ask anyone, anywhere and at any time. No one's going to truly tell you that they don't desire these things or want more of them. Now, we might spend our lives trying to satisfy these desires through different means, but we're all spending our lives in an endless pursuit of them, trying to fill this emptiness inside of us and this void that at some point in our lives we've all felt. This was my life, and maybe to some degree you can relate. And on the outside, I looked like I had it all together. Yet satisfying these desires, filling this void, and it was always right out of reach. In my mind, it was always, man, once I make this amount of money, or once I achieve this level of success, once I get this thing or that, then I will have made it. And feel contentment and happiness and try to find purpose in my life. And my question to you is, what are you chasing? Man, what is that thing that you think that, man, if you can just get it or get more of it, then I'll be happy. Or maybe if you can find the right person, or maybe you've tried so many things that you're left thinking, man, maybe there's something wrong with me. And maybe if I can just fix it or change this thing about myself, then I can find happiness and joy in my life. Then I'll be at peace. And maybe then I can find purpose in my life. And my next question for you is, why? But why is that the thing that you think will fill that void? And the answer is at least partially because you've been programmed into thinking that it will. And if you're unfamiliar with the principle of mental programming, you need to be. And just by being aware of this principle can help alter the course of your life. It's profound, but it's actually really quite simple. It can be summed up like this. Your brain comes into this world as a blank canvas, or like a computer that hasn't been programmed with any software. And then from the time we're born, our brains begin to be programmed with input or truths, which typically come from our parents and teachers and friends, as well as from what we read and watch and listen to. But here's the problem, that this input, these truths that have been programmed into our brains, that shape our worldview and how we think and act, have up to a certain point been completely out of our control. That's why most people vote and worship and believe the exact same things as their parents did. And as you think about this, you'll probably begin to ask yourself some questions like, what if the truths that have been programmed into my mind aren't true at all? And what if I would have been born to different parents in a different part of the world? And would I still think the same things were true about life? 
Would my beliefs be the same as they are now? And then this question, this is the big one. And what if what we've been programmed into thinking will bring us joy and happiness and peace and purpose, the things that we all universally want? won't actually bring us those things at all. And one of my favorite pro athletes of all time is Tom Brady. And if there's ever anyone that I can look at and say, man, this guy has it all, it's Tom Brady. He's won seven Super Bowls, considered by some to be the greatest football player of all time. He's got good looks, is incredibly rich, one of the most famous people on the planet, and was married to a supermodel. Yet in an interview with 60 Minutes in 2015, after winning his third championship, this is what he had to say. He said, man, I'm making more money now than I thought I could ever make playing football. And why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think that there's something greater out there for me? It's got to be more than this. And so here's someone who seems to have it all looks, fame, fortune, success, family, friends, yet still feels that there's this void that's yet to be filled, that something's still missing. And Tom Brady is living proof that none of the things that our culture makes us believe will bring us true fulfillment ever does. And the fact is, is that if we truly want to find what's missing in our life, and we have to make the decision to lay down these preconceived truths in our mind, and begin to venture down a new path and seek the truth no matter where it might lead. Because I can tell you that it's on that path that you'll find the treasure that you've been searching for. And not a treasure that's hidden, buried, or hard to find, but one that was meant to be found. A treasure that wants to be found by anyone who will seek it. It's a treasure that wants to be found by you. And so if you're ready, hit play on this next video and we'll take one step closer to finding it. Inside all of us is a code that specifies our design and our specific. So my wife bought me a smartwatch a few years ago for Christmas. But after I opened it up, I actually thought it was broken. I couldn't even get it to turn on. And it wasn't until I opened the owner's manual until I quickly realized how the watch was meant to function. Turns out that I had to download an app on my phone and pair the watch to an app using Bluetooth before it would even turn on and function the way that it was intended. What I thought was broken was just not being used properly. And for many of us, and that's how we feel about our lives, that something's broken or missing. Man, if we only had an owner's manual, right, that could reveal to us our intended function so that we can make sure that we're doing what we were meant to do and walking down the right path that'll lead us to the treasure that we seek. We'll come to find out we do. In the 1860s, a Swiss chemist by the name of Johann Friedrich Meisker caught the first glimpse of this owner's manual. It then took some of the brightest minds on earth another 140 years to bring it into full view. This owner's manual that we all have living within us is our genetic code. It's our DNA. It was discovered that all living things have DNA within them that specifies their structure or design and also their function. Let me say that again. Inside all of us is a code that specifies our design and our specific function. This code is so complex and carries such vast information that if we were to sit down and read it live, it would take us 31 years reading it day and night if we never stopped. And this vast, intelligent, and unique code not only lives inside of you, but lives within each of the 37.2 trillion cells within your body, carrying with it the blueprint of your design and instructions for your intended function. 
And at first, this is almost hard to comprehend, right? But if you think about it, it's really no different from the code that lives within the video games and websites and apps on our phones. And I've been in technology for a good part of my professional life, and I've led teams that have built these types of applications. I mean, we first think through what we want the product to do, function, and what we want it to look like, blueprint. And then we write the code and bring it to life. Amazon, TikTok, YouTube, Minecraft, they all have underlying code that dictates their design and function. The difference is that the code that we create for these applications is rudimentary compared to the vast intelligence within our own. And so the obvious question becomes, well, who wrote it? I mean, we've never found a blueprint for a design that wasn't written by somebody. And you can let that one sink in for a minute. When we observe living things in their natural state, it's actually easy to discern their specified functions. The magic behind DNA-driven functions are that they're innate, meaning they don't need to be taught. They naturally make themselves known to the living beings in which they live. It's our instincts or our intuition. Take a baby squirrel, for example. And a baby squirrel can be orphaned after birth, yet when the leaves begin to fall and the weather begins to get cooler outside, that squirrel will instinctively begin to store nuts for the winter. Its instincts tell it to do so, and it obeys. And if it didn't, it would set a course for a pretty dreadful existence and possibly starve to death. Or if a baby duck is orphaned at birth, when winter rolls around, you guessed it, it's gonna instinctively fly south. Why? Its instincts, its inner guide tells it to, and it obeys. Its instincts are giving it instructions for its own benefit, and the examples are limitless. Every living being has specific instructions written into their code to help lead them down the right paths and do the things that are best for them. And it's the same for you and for me. The problem that I suffered for a big part of my life is how I wasn't in tune with my internal instructions because I was too busy being tuned in to what other people thought of me. I was tuned into making money, climbing professional and social ladders, and keeping up with the culture around me. And you can fast forward to today and most of us spend our time being tuned into our iPhones or video games, computers and TVs. And when we're tuned into Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, Netflix, Sports Center, CNN, Fox News, and all the rest, it's almost impossible to be tuned into the instructions that are being given to us. Sound speeding on episode two. And in this next video, what we're gonna see is that in the same way that we can easily see the intended functions of other species by viewing them in their natural state, that we can also look back at our own species to the very first civilizations before the addictions of technology and ambition and fame and fortune and easily see the same innate behaviors of humans around the world playing out in harmony. Just as ducks around the world were all flying south for the winter. As we've watched these ancient civilizations on Earth, whether from beneath the overgrown rainforest in South America or from beneath the sands of the Middle East, there's always one constant. I have three kids. And either as you've experienced by having kids of your own or by being a sibling yourself, and you'll take it as no surprise when I say they are all very, very different from each other. My oldest daughter is artistic and is a writer, where my middle son plays sports and loves music. And then there's my youngest son, Knox, who we're all convinced is gonna be the next Indiana Jones. And Knox knows everything there is to know about ancient civilizations, sunken ships, hidden treasures, and is fairly convinced he knows the location of the lost city of Atlantis. And I wouldn't bet against him. And one of his favorite shows is called Lost Cities where modern technology is used to unearth ancient cities from long ago. 
As Knox and I have watched and studied these ancient civilizations, it's easy to begin to see the vast differences between them. From their physical traits, language, and dress to their cultures and customs. But what was even easier to see was that the same basic innate behaviors from these vastly separated people groups who didn't even know the others existed were playing out all around the world. And when I say easy to see, I mean can't be missed. As we've watched these ancient civilizations unearthed, whether from beneath the overgrown rainforest in South America or from beneath the sands of the Middle East, there's always one constant. That at the center of all of these ancient cities, towering above all the other structures, we always find a temple as a place to worship their creator. Why? Because their instincts told them to, and they obeyed. Do a quick Google search and you can find some of these amazing structures that have stood for thousands of years from all over the world. Spanning from Africa and Asia to Mesopotamia, North America, South America, and reaching all the way to remote island chains in the Atlantic and South Pacific. I mean, just think about that for a minute. From the beginning, the internal code of isolated people groups from every corner of the world has produced a belief that they were one, a product of creation. That two, that they should build a monument to the one who created them. And three, that they should worship that creator. The odds of this happening by chance are literally trillions to one. And as fascinating as that is, the common threads of innate human behavior tone in there. Not only did our ancient ancestors and all humans in their natural state innately believe that they had been created and feel a natural urge to worship their creator. But they also all believe that they could in some way communicate with that creator. From the beginning, our natural instincts have not only been to worship, but to pray. According to New World Encyclopedia, anthropologists now believe that the earliest humans practiced something that we would recognize today as prayer. With the first written prayers dating back over 5,000 years. Again, when we look at the mathematical odds of isolated people groups from around the world, all building temples of worship, the numbers are trillions to one. But when we add in the fact that they also all believed that they could communicate with that creator, the numbers become unfathomable. The only plausible explanation is that they were acting on instinct, written deep within their DNA. And the problem is, is that many people have been sold the lie that by accepting this primordial truth, they can no longer believe in science when in fact this is the most scientific explanation for human behavior that currently exists. In October of 2004, Time Magazine published an article which was featured on the front cover titled, The God Gene. Does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power? Believe it or not, some scientists say yes. The article explains how molecular biologists now believe that they have located the exact gene or gene patterns in our DNA that produces these very actions. And so, as I thought about this, this is, where the obvious came obvious for me. And the obvious was this, that I was meant to have a relationship with God, that he wants me to talk to him, that he wants to be at the center of my life. And he wants it so bad that he wrote it into my DNA so that my instincts would literally urge and lead me toward him. I was created to do these things and I wasn't doing any of them. And based on this obvious revelation, how could it come as any shock that my life felt off track and that something was missing? So now let me ask you the obvious question. 
Man, if your life feels off track, like there's a void that you can't quite seem to fill, that something's missing in your life. And my question is, are you functioning the way that you were meant to function? Are you doing what you were created to do? Because if not, what I hope you're beginning to see, it's that this severed connection between us and God is the source of that void within us. That void that for so long I desperately tried to fill with everything under the sun, except the one thing that was meant to fill it. So it becomes obvious that we need to reestablish our connection with God, but then the question becomes how? Like, where do we even start? And in trying to answer that question, I spent a good 10 years of my life studying different world religions and stoic philosophy, practicing yoga and meditation, and reading more self-help and New Age books than I can remember. But the one book I would never open was the Bible. You see, I'd grown up going to church. And like so many others, I left it behind as soon as I left my parents' house. And when I thought of Jesus, I would think of politicians I didn't like, preachers on TV asking for money, or the hypocrites I had known, or the people who had judged me, hurt me. But I thought back to this turning point in my life, which was this realization that some of the programming in my mind might not be true. And so I decided to read the teachings of Jesus without any preconceived opinions, or at least attempt to. And as I read, what I began to find was Jesus saying that, and he didn't come to judge people, but rather to save them. And instead of congregating with all of the religious people, and he was hanging out with the outcasts, saying that the kingdom of God was for everyone. And instead of focusing on a ton of rules, he was saying that everything boils down to loving God more than anything and loving other people the way we love ourselves. And in his teachings, I found a Jesus who was very different from the one I thought I knew. But it's when I began to understand his purpose that this light bulb came on for me. And I began to think back to all of the ancient civilizations from long ago and realize that there was this other common thread of instinctive human nature that I had overlooked. And it's crazy because it's so obvious that yes, there's always a temple at the center of these ancient civilizations, but when you look closer, what you find is that at the center or on the top of all of these ancient temples, you always find an altar. One of my favorite TV shows to watch with my family is the reality competition show Survivor. And on the show, a group of strangers are dropped off on an island where they've got to work together to create shelter, make fire, find food, and survive the elements, all while competing with each other in challenges to try to make it to the end and win the prize of a million bucks. During one season of the show, the host was walking through the jungle on the isolated island where the game was being played. And he was telling the story about the indigenous people who had lived on the island long ago. And how after the tribe of people would go to war with their adversaries from other nearby islands, they would come back and offer blood sacrifices so that they'd be forgiven for their sins in battle, for the purpose of restoring their relationship with God. And now after thinking about this for quite a while, here was my question. And who told them to do this? This was an indigenous and isolated tribe of people living on a tropical island in the middle of the South Pacific. Where did this belief system come from? Man, offering a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins to restore one's relationship with God could actually be traced back to the very beginning of almost every human civilization. Anthropologists have found evidence of this behavior spanning the globe from China, Japan, India, Europe, Africa, Greece, Egypt, the Middle East, North America, South America, 
the Arctic, the Hawaiian Islands, and yes, remote island chains in the South Pacific. According to Britannica, sacrifice and prayer have always been the fundamental acts of worship. And now before we go any further, let me just hit pause for a minute. Because the idea of sacrifice can be hard to swallow, at least for me. I mean, to the extent that if I ran into someone killing an animal in the midst of some ritual sacrifice, i will probably call the police. I mean, how could anyone have ever thought this up? Or back to our discussion, how could every human civilization around the world think this up, independent of each other? Again, the odds of this are trillions and trillions to one, leaving the only explanation that it was instinctual. But why? And to that question, I have no answer. But then again, I've got a lot of these questions that can't be answered, like, man, why are some animals made to kill and eat other animals? Why can't all animals just eat plants and get along, right? But as we've all hummed along with Elton John singing Circle of Life while watching The Lion King, we know that it's how our world was meant to function. And none of us can argue with that, whether we like it, understand it, or not. And just like we can see similarities in the temples which were built in different parts of the world, we can also see commonalities in these acts of sacrifice, especially when it comes to this idea of purity. Most early humans who practiced this ritual believed that the more pure the sacrifice, the more pleasing it would be to the Creator, and thus would be more effective. Because of this, it was very common for people to bring their very best livestock as a sacrifice, signifying that they were giving God their best. And so as I thought through this, it ultimately brought up more questions. Like how would these people even know that they needed restoration? Where does the idea of morality and the concepts of right and wrong even come from? What I found was that the answers once again stem from our internal code. You can travel the world today and no matter where you go, you're gonna find moral constants. There are certain things that almost all humans consider to be wrong. For example, murder, stealing, lying, cheating, and adultery. And this moral code is not just something that's been passed down or learned, but something that stems from within us, which is now believed to be evident even before we learn to talk. According to Psychology Today, there is a large body of research demonstrating and delineating the complex moral instincts of young children, including babies far too young for these to have been socialized into them. Babies exhibit empathy, fairness, justice, and the ability to judge goodness and badness of human behavior. And so if people have always had the instincts to know when they had done something wrong, then they have also always known when they needed to seek forgiveness and restoration with the one who created the very laws of morality in which they had broken. And this is where the story and purpose of Jesus not only began to make sense to me, but how it became the only rational answer to the void in the human condition that I had ever encountered that he had come to offer himself as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins for anyone who would receive it. And how this final and perfect sacrifice would break this endless cycle of offering blood sacrifices which had existed since the very beginning. And it did exactly that. Just look at the timeline of history. And it is when Jesus came is when this act of sacrifice began to dissipate all around the world. So what does that mean for you and me? How can that solve our problems? Bring us happiness and peace and purpose in this life. And in this next and final video, we'll find those answers together.
There are only a few stories that have had such an impact on our world and culture that when you hear them mentioned, you know exactly what's being talked about. Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, The Matrix. And you've at least heard of these stories, if not seen these movies multiple times. And outside of great writing, acting, and special effects, the one thing that these stories have in common is that at the core of these stories lies a prophecy of a savior. I mean, even the Lego movie is based on the prophecy of the master builder who's gonna save the world. Great movie, by the way. I am a master builder. And the reason this idea resonates with us the way it does is because it stems from the most famous story ever told, which is the story of Jesus Christ. And if you've never heard the story of Jesus, here it is. From the beginning, all people have sinned and broken their connection to God. And since that time, people have built altars and prayed to God and have offered sacrifices for forgiveness, but have never been able to permanently reestablish that connection to fill that void within them that only God can fill. And so out of his love for us, God sent a perfect and holy sacrifice for anyone who would receive it which would restore their connection to him and fill them with the spirit. And this restored connection would never be able to be broken again. And it would last throughout this lifetime and for eternity. And for the longest time, I, I saw how this story and the purpose of Jesus checked all the boxes, how it seemed to be the answer to my problem yet. And I resisted surrendering to it. And I knew about Jesus, but I didn't, know Jesus. And then one day someone suggested I read a book called Case for Christ. It was written by an agnostic investigative journalist who had done extensive research on the life and story of Jesus with the intent of proving it wrong. But at the end of his investigation, based on the overwhelming empirical evidence, he concluded that it would take more faith to believe that the story of Jesus wasn't true than to believe that it was just based on 300 of the prophecies that were made about Jesus that spanned thousands of years before his birth, of which he fulfilled every one, the odds were over 100 trillion to one that he was the savior that came for me and for you. And if it were true, man, it would make sense that after 2000 years, his birth death and resurrection would be the most famous story ever told. Or that Time Magazine, after using a computational data-centric analysis, came to the conclusion that Jesus was the most significant person to ever walk the face of the earth. And it would make sense why every time we write down the day's date, we're reminded of how many years ago it was when he willfully died on a cross to become that very sacrifice for you and me. And it would make sense that since that time as the story has spread and this treasure has continued to be found, that the act of blood sacrifice has dissipated all around the world. And I'm not sure when it happened. All I know is one day I found myself alone in the silence and I found myself praying to God. I told him how sorry I was for ignoring him, for not talking to him, and for not giving him my worship. And I thanked him for not giving up on me and for his willingness to forgive me of everything that I had done while I was disconnected from him. I thanked him for sending Jesus to die as a sacrifice for my sins. I told him I was ready to place him at the center of my life. And it was then that I claimed my treasure. I claimed the sacrifice and asked God to forgive me, to connect with me, and to fill that deep void within me with his spirit. And at that moment, any doubt that remained was washed away not because of what I knew in my head, but because of what I experienced in my heart. 
I felt God's presence come over me and it brought me to tears. And I found the love and the happiness and the peace that I had been seeking. And this treasure that has changed my life is available to you. There are no exceptions. Whether you're Jewish, a Buddhist, a New Age yogi, or have denied God's existence your entire life, this treasure is for you. nothing you have to work for or earn. It is a gift that was given to anyone who would accept it. Because God loves you. Because He's been waiting for you. And He wants to shower you with His love and His grace and His acceptance. And He wants a relationship with you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And if you're ready to finally fill that void inside of you, all you have to do is say this prayer with me right now. Just say, God, I'm sorry that I've ignored you for so long in my life. Man, thank you for not giving up on me. Man, I know that I'm not perfect and that I've sinned, but I'm ready to place you at the center of my world and follow you wherever you might lead me. Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to die and be the sacrifice for my sins. And I claim that sacrifice now. Please forgive me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And if you just prayed that prayer, you now have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And you have been born again into a life of joy and happiness peace and purpose. And if you did just pray that prayer, or whether you're still searching, either way, make sure to click on the link below for resources to either help you find those answers that you're still looking for or to help you take those next steps down a path that God has just for you.